This is Duke University. I'm Siegel and I co-direct the program in public law here at Duke Law School. Our subject today is select important decisions of the Supreme Court of the United States during uh, the October 2000 term in criminal cases. Uh, the October 2000 term references the term that ended uh, at the end of June 2011. The October 2011 term will begin on the first Monday uh, this coming October. So please be on the lookout for a Supreme Court preview uh, sponsored by the program in public law during lunch at that time. This past term, the OT 2010 term, the court issued 82 opinions deciding the merits of 84 cases. 19 of those cases fell into the criminal category, an additional eight involved the writ of habeas corpus. So when you combine them, roughly 32% of the docket consisted of criminal or habeas cases. Joining me on the panel today are professors Sarah Beal, uh, Jim Coleman, Lisa Griffin, and Sam Buell. We're going to start now with Professor Beal, who I believe has a handout going around. She's going to discuss a rare and consequential decision by the Supreme Court approving a prison population limit in California's prisons as a remedy for continuing violations of prisoners' constitutional rights. Professor Beal. Uh, thanks very much. Uh, that's right, and you kind of took my, uh, my uh, first line away. So I'm talking about a case uh, that um, is important for a number of reasons, and it's called Brown versus Plata, and it is a um, five to four decision. The majority opinion was written by Justice Kennedy, and I want to tell you a little bit about what the holding was, and then some of the things that I think make it interesting. It's about a hundred page opinion, so um, that won't be able to give you kind of all the bells and whistles. And there is just a single sheet that has some pictures uh, coming around um, that I'm going to refer to. OK, so what did it hold and why is it interesting? It affirms it's an appeal from a three-judge court. And those of you I see some, uh, what I think of as recidivists here, some upper-class students who probably, like an appeal, an ap not a cert petition, an appeal, huh? Three-judge court. All right, so there's some, some interesting procedural aspects that you may want to ask about during the question and answer period um, uh, if we might want to get into that. But it affirms the order of a three-judge court holding that the state of California must reduce its prison population to 137% of its uh, capacity, design capacity, within two years in order to remedy chronic fra failures by the state to provide adequate medical and mental health care to inmates that the court, uh, the lower court found and the Supreme Court affirmed this finding constituted uh, chronic and systematic violations of the Eighth Amendment cruel and unusual punishment clause. This would require the release of up to 46,000 prisoners um, within the state. The opinion was the most recent, and I'm going to predict not the final chapter, in uh, long-running litigation. Uh, the first case that there are two um, consolidated class actions here, the first of which was filed in 1990. And f more than 15 years ago, the court in that first case found that the state was violating the rights of California inmates, and it ordered that the state should come up with a way to provide adequate mental health care. And it appointed a receiver, and the state began working with the receiver, and now, 20 some years later, there's a finding that the state is not satisfactorily meeting its constitutionally based obligations to provide mental health um, care. And there are a lot of details. The court held um, the, the consolidated uh, case involved a very long factual hearing at which lots of witnesses uh, were called, and it included as well some visual uh, information. And so um, if you look at the page here that has only one photo on it, uh, this is cages for holding people who were waiting for mental health treatment. They're about the size of a telephone booth that was described. They have no toilet facilities. 
And there was testimony, for example, that people would be held up to 24 hours who were mentally ill and were waiting to get treatment. Uh, and, uh, for example, one person was found after 24 hours standing in a pool of his own urine in a catatonic state. Now, I can't give you a medical description of catatonic, but you understand. All right, uh, that this is a sort of extreme uh, uh, decompensation uh, psychologically. So um, very extreme uh, conditions uh, found. And just to jump ahead a little bit, as long as we're on this little piece of paper, flip over on the other side, it, the court found that many of these conditions were the um, direct outgrowth of this dramatic overcrowding within the prison system. And I just want you to look at those photos of places that people lived for potentially 5, 10, 15, 20 uh, years, okay? And I want to come back to the fact that these photos are from the court's opinion, which is interesting. Okay. So um, 20 years of litigation, receivers ordering the state to comply, the state saying it would comply, coming up with plans, a second lawsuit filed in another part of the state, finding um, grievous violations, ordering the state to comply, the state trying to comply, the state unable to comply, lots of testimony about really, really, really bad uh, conditions. And I might give you just a couple. It's hard to know exactly where to, where to stop um, with some of this information. And, um, you know, it's kind of not our um, focus here, although as a public information um, session, the idea that we should know what's happening in our prison is probably a good thing. Uh, so, uh, for example, uh, in uh, there's testimony about how the overcrowding affected um, conditions in the prison. In 2006, the suicide rate in California's prisons was 80% higher than the national average, and the special master found that more than 72% of the suicides involved some measure of inadequate assessment, treatment, or intervention. Physical illnesses, um, prisoners who had no way of getting treatment on their own, solely reliant on the state, um, were uh, not uh, receiving adequate treatment. In one prison, up to 50 sick inmates were held together in a 12 by 20 foot cage for many hours while waiting for treatment. A prisoner with severe abdominal pain died after five weeks of delay and referral to a specialist, a prisoner with Constant and extreme chest pain died after an eight-hour delay in evaluations. Uh, one of the experts uh, said that extreme departures from the standard of care were, quote, widespread, and that the proportion of possibly preventable deaths was extremely high. Uh, so uh, the uh, findings here were part of a uh, lengthy trial and a sort of documentation of Two things, failure to provide adequate mental and physical uh, care, uh, general medical care, as well as mental health care, and a link, a link to overcrowding, although, right, there, there's a tension uh, between those two. So what you have is class actions seeking not to enforce the right of some individual prisoner, like the person who was in the little telephone booth, Right, and decompensated and was catatonic, but seeking structural reform and overall order to the state that would result in what? Building more prisons, shifting prisoners from state prisons to the local uh, jails, um, releasing prisoners earlier, sending fewer people into the prisons, some structural change um, to uh, respond to this. Obviously, that raises kind of separation of powers issues, uh, courts telling the political branches of government what to do, right? and federalism issues, because it's the US Supreme Court and the federal courts in general telling the state system, the state governor, the state legislature, the state prison officials, what they must do under the, what, under the auspices of the Eighth Amendment Cruel and Unusual Punishment Clause. This is certainly not the first case, not the first case that has held that when you hold a person in custody, failure to provide adequate mental or me medical or mental health care can constitute a violation of the Cruel and Unusual Punishment Clause. What is different here is, number one, it's a structural 
um, reform injunction to the state. Number two, very, very large in its implications, the whole state, not just one, uh, not just one uh, prison. And when you think about the implications, obviously in terms of public safety, right, um, very significant uh, potential here. It comes as a kind of a um, next stage in a set of, of historical moves. So in the 1990s, California enacted the toughest three strikes statute in the country. Um, the third strike doesn't have to be a violent strike. The third strike can actually be, the third, the third uh, conviction, can actually be misdemeanor that gets bumped up. It's a wobbler that gets bumped up and treated like a felony if the person has a prior criminal record. And in uh, 2003, the US Supreme Court with Justice Kennedy writing the majority held that that California three strike statute did not violate the cruel and unusual punishment clause when it required a 25 year to life sentence for shoplifting three golf clubs. Justice Kennedy said it's up to the states. Federal, the federal constitution doesn't deprive the states and their political bodies of making choices about criminal justice policy. Right, that's all left to the states and the political branches with very, very, very minimal federal limits and oversight. Justice Kennedy then went to the American Bar Association and gave a riveting, an absolutely riveting lecture to the assembled body of lawyers saying, this is a political issue. You all are responsible for changing things. We do have too much imprisonment. And he charged them and charged kind of all of us right, to be doing something about this, but not be relying on the Supreme Court to fix it. Well, California's prison population continued to grow, right? Governor Schwarzenegger declared an, an emergency, but didn't manage to get it down to anything close to its capacity. This California state doesn't have a lot of money. Justice Kennedy kept going out on the hustings and giving lectures and talking about the politics of crime and so on. And then we get uh, this case in front of the Supreme Court. And he writes the opinion, five to four, basically saying, if you lock them up, right, you got to have minimally adequate conditions for them and affirming this decision under the Prison Litigation Reform Act. Five to four, pretty strenuous dissents. Justice Scalia saying courts can't tell how prisons should be run. It's grossly inappropriate, grossly a uh, violation of the judicial um, function. And Justice Alito sounding an alarm that the public safety values had not been adequately considered Noticing, noting that um, the court was potentially ordering the release of the equivalent of three battalions of prisoners, uh, and that uh, this could dramatically affect public safety. Uh, one of the comments uh, subsequently, fear-mongering from the bench, uh, criticizing uh, Scalia and Alito for failing to note that the majority gave the state lots of different ways and leeway to figure out they don't have to release people, they can send it to local institutions, they can do good time credits, they can not bring parole violators back into the system. It doesn't say pick 46,000 people at random and release the you know, ax murderers, right? Um, but there is a tension there, isn't there, between public safety goals and between baseline obligations to human beings, right, and how far courts are going to go wade into this, this inherent policy choice um, and whether they can in some way, shape, or, or uh, form uh, make a change like this. Certainly, the litigation up to this point has not been successful in solving the problem. So um, I'm sure I'm over my time. All right, well, thank you very much, Professor Beal. Uh, next, we're going to hear from Professor Coleman, who will discuss a decision that imposed limits on the evidence that a federal court may consider in deciding whether to grant a petition for a writ of habeas corpus. OK, this, this case is called Cullen versus uh, Pinholster, and um, it's also out of California. Uh, Pinholster is the kind of uh, defendant who, if he had not been sentenced to death, would not have been released under the Brown decision either. So uh, that was a joke. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I was first. laughing to myself. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, lighten up a little bit. <laughs> uh, okay, so let me, let me tell you a little bit first, just a little bit about uh, 
what a, what a habeas case is for, for those of you uh, who don't know. Um, a, a habeas uh, action is one in federal court where a prisoner in state court who was convicted under state law is challenging his either conviction or sentence or both on the ground that one or both uh, violate the uh, United States Constitution or federal law or some treaty that the United States, to which the United States is a signatory and has uh, ratified. Uh, one of the requirements for a habeas case is that first you present the claim to state court. It's called an, an exhaustion requirement. Uh, and then once the state court uh, has ruled on the claim, it can either rule on the merits of the claim or it can decide on some procedural ground not to reach the merits. Uh, and at that point, the claim can then be presented in federal court. So the issue in the Cullen case or the Penholster case uh, was uh, about a decision made by the Ninth Circuit uh, on Banc uh, with three judges dissenting, um, where Penholster claimed that his lawyer had been ineffective uh, in, uh, in defending him during the penalty phase of a capital case. This already has become too complex, right? Uh, it, it involves both uh, capital punishment law and then habeas law. And habeas law is, is made even more complex uh, because uh, you can't just uh, get a federal court to review a claim de novo. The court is severely limited uh, by something called the Anti-Terrorism and Effective Death Penalty Act, uh, which requires it, uh, in effect, to defer to the decisions of state uh, courts. So the issue in this case was whether a district court could hold an evidentiary hearing on a claim that had been presented to the state court and the state court had decided on the merits, could the district court hold an evidentiary hearing and then consider that new evidence uh, in deciding whether the decision of the state court should be, uh, in effect, uh, overturned? Okay, that's kind of the simplified version of what happens. Uh, there, were two procedural, there were two issues before the court. One was a procedural issue, which is, does the uh, Anti-Terrorism and Effective Death Penalty Act permit uh, a federal court in reviewing the decision of a state court on the merits of a claim to consider new evidence that is uh, presented to the federal court uh, in an evidentiary hearing? Okay, that's, that's one uh, issue, procedural issue. And then the second issue related to the merits of the ineffective assistance of counsel claim, that is, did the Ninth Circuit get it right? Uh, the, the last thing you want to be if you're representing a habeas uh, client is the respondent in the Supreme Court <clears throat> from uh, where the court is reviewing a decision from the Ninth Circuit. <laughs> where there were dissents, uh, and that's a position that Penholster was in uh, on the procedural question whether the district court can have an evidentiary hearing uh, and consider new evidence uh, in connection with Penholster's ineffective assistance of counsel claim. The court said no, uh, and I think that's correct. I mean, I, I don't think that it, uh, even though, you know, I, uh, I, I'm generally sympathetic to habeas petitioners. I think the, the uh, ADEPA, the federal statute, uh, was intended to limit the federal court's consideration of evidence to the evidence that was before the state court. And that's what the court decided. And it decided that in a 7-2 decision, uh, in other words, seven justices agreed with that result, uh, sort of an odd couple dissenting, uh, Justice Alito and Justice uh, Sotomayor. Uh, Justice Alito, though, dissenting uh, only on the question of law, but said that he, he would have agreed that the district court should not have held an evidentiary hearing in this case. And so, in effect, uh, he voted with the uh, majority on the merits of the ineffective assistance of counsel claim. Um, 
Let, let me just end by this way. There, there are two songs that I think uh, help you to understand the Supreme Court's uh, uh, jurisprudence in this area. Uh, one is Paul Simon's uh, 50 Ways to Leave Your Lover. <laughs> <laughs> so I would say read, read the opinion and then uh, read the lyrics to that song. Uh, and you'll understand what I mean. The court, uh, it's, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's easy to do. <laughs> uh, there are a lot of ways to do it, and, and this is just another way that the court has found uh, for a habeas pe a petitioner to lose. Uh, <laughs> and, and, then, and then the other song is John Lennon's Imagine, uh, and that one is relevant to the court's decision on the merits of the ineffective assistance of counsel claim. The court said there that basically all that the district court, not all, but that the district court is required to imagine ways in which a competent lawyer might have done what the defense lawyer in the case did. And if there are um, fair-minded judges who would disagree with the Ninth Circuit uh, decision that the California court got it wrong, then the defendant loses. Uh, and uh, five justices on the Supreme Court disagreed with the Ninth Circuit uh, and concluded that, uh, that what the defendant did in this case uh, was something that uh, a uh, competent lawyer might have done. Uh, it was, in effect, a Hail Mary pass. Uh, but the court said that uh, that doesn't really matter. The question is, uh, is this something that lawyers in the jurisdictions uh, have done in the past? Uh, the court doesn't look into whether it was successful, only whether it had been tried. Uh, and in death cases, lawyers are desperate. And so there's hardly anything that you can imagine that lawyers haven't already tried. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Professor Coleman. I understand that Professor Coleman is eager to sing either or both of those songs upon request, uh, which, uh, which may take place at 120 when we're finished. Uh, now we're going to turn to Professor Griffin, who's going to discuss two decisions concerning the Confrontation Clause of the Sixth Amendment of the Constitution. Uh, the Confrontation Clause provides that in all criminal prosecutions, the accused shall enjoy the right to be confronted with the witnesses against him. Professor Griffin. Um, so what's interesting about that Confrontation Clause cases this term is that um, they are not blockbusters uh, like Brown versus Plata was, um, nor are they, am I really in a position to set them to music um, in the way that <laughs> Professor Coleman did, but I think that they are um, intensely illustrative of some really important themes in Supreme Court jurisprudence in general and particularly in constitutional criminal procedure. Um, and because they are follow-ons to a real blockbuster, which was a 2004 decision in Crawford versus United States, uh, or rather Crawford versus Washington, where the court held that um, the Sixth Amendment, and this was the first time they had so held after a quarter century of construing the Confrontation Clause to be more or less coextensive with the hearsay rules, um, by which I mean that it is possible that statements are admitted in court against criminal defendants if they are deemed, for evidentiary purposes, reliable. There is, however, a clause in the Sixth Amendment, the Confrontation Clause that Professor Siegel just cited, which says that criminal defendants have the right to confront the witnesses against them. And in 2004, the Supreme Court said, wait a minute, even hearsay statements that might be reliable and that might fit within the evidence rules offered against criminal defendants might require confrontation, by which the court has always meant cross-examination. Um, and that really did affect a sea change in terms of things that could be admitted against criminal defendants at trial. Um, Justice Scalia has um, been leading the charge in terms of this categorical interpretation of the Sixth Amendment. And when he announced it in 2004, he didn't really define it. Um, and so what I think is interesting about the, this term's cases is that they, they demonstrate something that's been happening since then. Um, some themes of what happens when the court announces new constitutional rules and doesn't fully define what they mean by them. Um, the first is a, is a familiar one to you, which is unintended consequences. Um, sometimes uh, these are referred to as aftermarket modifications. Um, you <laughs> announce a constitutional right. In the Crawford case, um, the, the statements in question were in the context of a rather formal interview um, between the witness, um, who later was the spouse of the defendant and later exercised her privilege not to testify. And so they looked like 
what a witness does. They looked like testimony. They were easy for the court, and um, the, it was a, a unanimous decision, although the um, Je Chief Justice Rehnquist and Justice O'Connor concurred um, and didn't really agree with the reasoning of it, but seven justices, including Justices Breyer and Kennedy, who have since completely jumped ship on this decision, went along with it, partly because of the facts. Shortly thereafter, and this is a very condensed time period for the court to deal with the meaning of a constitutional pronouncement like this. Between 2004 and 2010, we've seen them grapple with almost all of its extensions. Usually they have longer periods of time, sometimes a whole generation, um, to try to figure out what a constitutional right means. But this was effectively a new right. And the next time they confronted what it meant was in the context of 911 calls, um, to seeking help um, in an emergency situation. And then they had to address, OK, well, is that what a witness does? Is that testimonial? Um, and they decided that, uh, for the most part, um, it, it is and it isn't. It is um, when it's giving details about an assailant. It's not um, when it's just seeking help for an emergency, um, seeking response to an emergency. They, um, they declared uh, a test um, called the primary purpose test, where they decided, OK, from now on, we're going to look to see what the primary purpose is um, of the witness who's speaking. So that was the first aftermarket modification. It was a little bit tricky, but they got around it and they established this primary purpose test. The problem is there are lots and lots of out-of-court statements that criminal defendants might want to either exclude or have the opportunity to cross-examine that do not look like these formal encounters with law enforcement or these tape-recorded calls to 911 operators. Um, they involve uh, sort of on-the-ground policing, statements that are hard to, to characterize, and another category that's been very tricky is forensic analysis. What are lab chemists doing when they issue reports um, if for use in later criminal prosecutions? Are they testifying? Are they witnesses? Is that something that needs to be cross-examined? Um, so the court has, has struggled with that. Um, the other thing that is really interesting about this condensed uh, period of time is um, what you might call buyer's remorse. Um, you have seen justices jump ship on the Crawford Coalition very, very quickly. Um, it's not surprising that Justices Roberts and Alito, who no longer seem to agree with Crawford's essential um, holding, uh, would have um, struck out in a different direction. They, were, they, were, they replaced Chief Justice Rehnquist and Justice O'Connor, who were around at the time of Crawford. But they did join um, the Davis and Hammond decisions a couple years later. Um, and now they are routinely dissenting in <clears throat> Confrontation Clause cases because as each iteration comes around, the facts are seeming potentially more onerous from a law enforcement perspective, um, potentially to raise administrability problems in the criminal courts. Um, what's interesting is, uh, and, and Justices Breyer and Kennedy, um, who, have, who went along with Justice Scalia and Crawford and in the subsequent cases, have now declared themselves to be, to have to utter buyer's remorse. Um, and this has led to some very snippy exchanges at oral arguments, um, some extremely what have been described as dyspeptic opinions by Justice Scalia. Um, <coughs> there was a, a very controversial editorial by Linda Greenhouse not long ago in the New York Times about Justice Scalia identifying this Crawford decision, this one incursion into constitutional criminal procedure as really the only significant thing that in all of his years on the court he can lay total claim to as a change in constitutional law. Some people think maybe the Heller decision on the Second Amendment would count as well, but this is probably his clearest and most resounding victory in terms of a position that he has advocated. There's some sentencing decisions. There's some other areas I think maybe she overlooked, but, but I, you can see why she's making this point. And as he loses colleagues one by one, um, and the, the, the decision, I think, is, is really in jeopardy in the term to come and, and, the, and the following terms, um, he gets increasingly vitriolic in his, in his dissents. Um, and then the last theme that I, that I think it, it represents is what um, is sometimes called incremental overruling. Um, this has been uh, very notable in the Fifth and Fourth Amendment context. The court announces, okay, there's an exclusionary rule, um, you violate the strictures of the Fourth Amendment, the evidence stays out of court. And then term by term for decades, every single term, they announce some exception to that until the exclusionary rule has very little force and isn't affecting many criminal prosecutions. Um, there's a you know, major uh, decision in the Fifth Amendment context when the court announces in Miranda that people have to receive warnings before they're interrogated, and, and the, the failure to get those warnings would lead, for the, lead to those statements being excluded. And then term after term for decades after Miranda, the court carves out exceptions until it's very difficult to make a successful argument um, under Miranda. The same thing is happening in the Sixth Amendment context, but it's interesting because the tables are a little bit turned in terms of the justices who are engaged in the incremental 
overruling um, process. Um, what, what has happened now is that the factors the court is willing to consider in deciding whether a witness is in fact bearing testimony in a way that would require cross-examination pursuant to the Sixth Amendment look exactly like the factors that the court was applying for 25 years, um, starting with hmm. Ohio versus Roberts, um, which was a reliability test. Um, and that test, Justice Scalia said, in Crawford was amorphous, entirely subjective, subject to case-by-case -case application by the courts, way too discretionary. Um, so what's happened, though, is as they confront these more and more difficult factual situations, um, and I'll end by telling you what the facts are in this case in which this was all announced. I've spoken in very general terms, but of course, um, there's always a, a, the facts of the court says and then a backstory. So the facts of Michigan versus Bryant are 3 o'clock in the morning, police are summoned. They get an anonymous phone call, um, not particularly surprising under the circumstances, that there's been a shooting um, in a neighborhood in Detroit. They arrive at a gas station um, where Anthony Covington is lying on the concrete in the, grass, in the gas station by his car with the engine still idling, um, bleeding out. And he does subsequently die at the hospital. And he says that he's been, sh they ask what happened, that was their first question. Five police officers respond. There's no one else at the gas station. There doesn't seem to be any immediate um, emergency, um, other than the fact that Mr. Covington, of course, is, is about to expire. And um, he, he, what happened? I was shot. They ask him who shot him. He says Rick shot him. He effectively identifies the later defendant. Um, Bryant. And the court's debate is, okay, are those statements, Mr. Covington is dead, he cannot be cross-examined in court, are his statements subject to cross-examination? The majority of the court, with Justice Sotomayor authoring the opinion, said, um, no, that's okay. Um, that's not testimonial because it was an emergency. He was dying, the police just wanted to secure the scene. Um, here's the problem, though. It turns out that it was a drug dispute. Um, Covington, and none of these facts are in the Supreme Court's opinion. Um, Covington was um, having a disagreement with, with Brian about a coat that he had pawned in order to buy narcotics, and Brian was a, a drug dealer. Um, he went to his home at 3 o'clock in the morning um, to ask him about this dispute, to engage in the dispute again, and was shot through the door of the house. And there are other people um, who might have been the shooters as well. The description he gives of the shooter doesn't actually match Bryant, and he never saw the shooter. The, the forensics order, the bullets actually went through a door of the house, and he identified him by voice, fled the scene, went to the gas station, was seen by the police officers. If you look closely at the statement, it is the kind of thing as a criminal defendant you might want to cross-examine. Um, there is great material there for a really good cross-examination, and it's entirely possible that Covington has no idea um, who shot him. But the court, it's a murder case. This is the most important evidence. It's going to be lost evidence. And they engage in exactly the kind of case-by-case -case balancing that they used to do under the reliability framework. And they decide, here's what they care about. How close in time the statement is to the, the incident, the nature of the questions that are asked, um, whether the, the speaker is using the present or past tense in responding, where the encounter takes place, whether you could call it a formal or an informal encounter, um, whether the crime at issue is uh, domestic violence where there might just be one victim or a more broadly violent crime where we have to worry about other members of the community, whether a gun or a knife or some other weapon is used, what the medical and emotional condition of the victim is, um, and then best of all, um, they say, whether or not the statement would have been admissible pursuant to the rules of hearsay. And this is the thing that gets Justice Scalia's attention. But the point of it is, and absent that, he probably wouldn't have been so vitriolic about it, but the point is they've arrived at exactly um, the same place where they started. Um, and that is often uh, what happens after blockbusters have been announced. Um, slowly they, they change back into to other things, sometimes very familiar things. And that's what's happening with the Confrontation Clause. Well, thank you, Professor uh, Griffin. Uh, much of what the Supreme Court does in criminal cases is interpret federal laws, including federal criminal laws. Uh, Professor Buell is going to talk to us about the court's two recent interpretations of federal laws, the, wit the Federal Witness Tampering Statute and the Speedy Trial Act. Um, so I, I do think this was not a momentous a term in criminal law, maybe, maybe with the exception of the California case, which is, although a case about the Eighth Amendment, really a case about criminal justice policy and not right. uh, how pro crimes get prosecuted. Um, but there's always interesting statutory interpretation work going on in the Supreme Court in the criminal area, and I want to talk about a couple of cases from this term that appeal to me as a statutory interpretation geek, which many of you know I am. 
um, because they, they, like a lot of statutory interpretation cases, there's sort of more that's going on here than, than meets the eye. So the, the first one is a case called Fowler versus the United States, and this comes out of Florida. And, um, and this is a federal criminal prosecution of somebody for um, killing a police officer. And what happened was um, some uh, young men were preparing to rob a bank. A uh, state police officer came across them. It was evident to the officer that, uh, uh, that um, uh, wrongdoing was afoot. And uh, he approached the men. He uh, spoke to them. Uh, one of them recognized him and uh, uh, or he recognized one of them and spoke to them by name, that, that person by name, at which point um, the defendant said, now we can't wet, walk away from this thing, and he shot and killed the police officer. Now, how does this end up in federal court? Well, uh, there is a federal statute, a so-called witness tampering statute, which seems like an understatement uh, in light of what happened here, um, which makes it a crime to kill, among other things, to kill somebody with the intent to prevent the communication to a federal law enforcement officer of information relating to a federal offense. So uh, bank robbery is a federal offense. This was not a federal law enforcement officer. Uh, and the question is, uh, was this, this statute uh, satisfied here? Did this murder happen with the intent to prevent the communication of information relating to a federal offense, here bank robbery, to a federal officer. Um, this is a mens rea or mental state problem in the criminal law because we've got to decide what's the intent requirement in this statute. Does he have to know that, uh, that the uh, information is going to a, a federal officer? Does he have to intend to prevent communication to a federal officer or just some officer that happens to be federal or could be federal? Now the statute here seems to kind of answer the question. A lot of times we would stop there and we'd have to just interpret the statute, see, see a lot of problems like that in federal criminal law. But here we have a, a separate statutory provision that says no mental state need be proved as to the circumstance that the law enforcement officer is a federal law enforcement officer. So no, we do not need to prove that uh, Mr. Fowler here uh, had in mind that the, that the of course not the person he was killing, he knew that was a state officer, but even that the information that that state officer would have conveyed had he not killed him would have gone to a, a federal officer. So, uh, so what's the problem in this case? Well, the problem is uh, a part problem of policy. Uh, although the Supreme Court doesn't write its statutory interpretation decisions that way. It's not going to start out saying, we have a policy problem here that this statute leaves us with. But essentially, it's a policy problem. The policy problem is that if, in fact, there is no proof required at all with respect to this information going to a federal officer, then every witness killing is a federal crime that can be prosecuted in federal court as long as there is some federal offense involved in what the person was trying to cover up that could have been prosecuted. Uh, and since there are so many federal crimes now, uh, and it is the case that huge uh, portions of criminal activity in the United States which are prosecutable in state court are also prosecutable in federal court, the statute has the potential to essentially bootstrap uh, m many, many, many witness killing cases into federal cases if, the, in fact, it's interpreted to require um, proof only that there could have been a federal prosecution somehow here. So what does the Supreme Court do with this um, problem? Um, it says, well, we have to interpret what the language of the statute means. And there are uh, three uh, outcomes that, that, that are suggested. One is the majority opinion uh, authored by Justice Breyer, where he concludes that the rule is that the government has to prove that there was a reasonable likelihood that the information in the particular case would have been uh, conveyed to a federal officer, and reversal of this conviction is required because the jury at this Fowler's trial was not told that that was the standard, even if we think in Fowler's case it could have been satisfied um, fairly easily. They weren't told that was the standard, and so a uh, new trial is required. How does Breyer get to reasonable likelihood, which doesn't appear anywhere in the statute? He says uh, the word prevent in the statute uh, mean, has as part of its meaning that something be reasonably likely. One cannot intend to prevent something that can't happen. 
uh, and the example he uses at the end of his opinion is, if I kill an, a law enforcement officer without really thinking about what I'm trying to prevent, except bad things that might happen to me as a result of what that officer might do or say, uh, it, it's not, we can't say that I killed that officer to prevent communication of information to the Lithuanian police about what I was doing, if I'm Fowler committing a crime in Florida. Uh, and so the word prevent itself has this reasonable likelihood concept built into it. Um, Scalia dissents, uh, actually no, concurs, also says that the conviction should be reversed, but, um, but, but writes for himself saying uh, the, 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 this isn't a mental state element at all. He reads the statute as saying, this is a separate element of the crime, that is, that would have gone to a, a federal law enforcement officer, the information, and that must be proved beyond a reasonable doubt, like any element of any a crime. And then finally, we have a, a, a dissent authored by Alito, joined by Justice Ginsburg, in which uh, Justice Alito says, Justice Scalia doesn't know what he's talking about. This is clearly a mens rea element. It's not a separate fact about the case that has to be proved. It's just a question of this guy's intent. And Alito says, uh, all we have to uh, prove is that he intended to uh, co prevent the communication of information about something that was a federal offense. And as the statute says, no mental state needs to be proved as to the, 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 the fact that the person to whom it will be communicated is a federal officer. And, uh, and so this is an easy case, according to, to Alito. So a couple of interesting things going on here. Um, one, uh, this is just so typical of sort of difficult mental state problems that arise in federal criminal statutes, and particularly where we have a situation like this, where Congress has written a statute that seems to incorporate um, something, arguably, that uh, has to do with a hypothetical kind of mental state inquiry. You know, if this guy had really thought about it, what would he have thought was going to happen? Which is, you know, a very strange kind of inquiry to conduct in a, a, a federal, um, or any kind of a, a criminal a trial. I also think it's interesting that um, mainly here that this case uh, is decided against the background of an ongoing debate uh, issue concern of the last 20, 30 years of the expansion of federal criminal law and the balance between state and, and federal respons responsibility in the area of criminal law. And this is a case, like a lot of cases we uh, have seen, where there's, you're dealing with a federal crime that overlaps a lot of state activity potentially. The issue is statutory, the, the, the problem in the case is statutory interpretation, but the Supreme Court has a discussion about that that is very much uh, overshadowed by this policy concern about the expansion of federal criminal law. And uh, the, you can see the majority here as essentially trying to find some middle ground that doesn't convert every possible state offense into a federal crime here. You can see Justice Scalia uh, taking the position that it ought to be really, really difficult, actually, to make th these uh, federal offenses. And Justice Alito, interestingly, uh, not seeming to have any, any concern about that at all. And Justice Alito, Alito, of course, is a former United States attorney, a former federal prosecutor. And one of the things I wondered um, reading this decision was, uh, you, you know, d does this fit into some larger story about Justice Alito's views on federal power? And might that be interesting in thinking about how he um, is going to uh, uh, think about the health care uh, case when it comes before the court because uh, he's been um, you know, with the conservatives on the court on many of the core long-term agenda items of the conservatives on the court, but on some of these federal uh, power issues, maybe not so much. I'm going to um, stop there. I had another case I wanted to talk about, but we need to leave some time for questions. So, Okay. Well, thank you very much. Uh, let's Now we have five minutes remaining. Let's open it up to you folks. Any questions you might have about any of these cases or uh, anything else? on your mind with respect to the Roberts Court and the criminal law. Yes, Pete. Professor Beale, on the, the notion that yeah, there's a federalism problem with an injunction about a structural change, can you tell a little bit more on, on how that differs from what I would think of as an ordinary ruling that there's a, a cruel and unusual punishment restriction that simply puts a limit. The state can do anything it wants, but you can't. Run past that limit, yeah, yeah. You know, one one way I was thinking about it is that they're they're really two different, but in this case, overlapping problems. So one is courts versus the democratically elected bodies, right? And so that that would be um, courts sort of coming to grips with the the 
question, you know, should it be 137%, how many years, right? Um, how, how good does the care have to be? You know, when do we find there is a violation and so forth? And even if it were a state court, right, saying we're not just going to give relief to, this, to these individuals who individually brought suit, we're going to tell you, you got to come in and convince us, right, that, that your overall plan for how you're going to reform the entire California system, right, satisfies us, right, and, and we're going to choose a, a benchmark number and we're going to, right, see if you meet those criteria. That's a huge um, change in judicial function, isn't it, right? And, and really shouldering a lot of responsibility to make findings on those things. So structural reform of prisons, of mental hospitals, of school systems for the desegregation, raise all those kinds of issues. And here, layered over that, you have federal versus state. So it's not just the state California courts saying, OK, we, we've got the standard. You have the US Supreme Court off somewhere, or these three judge courts telling the state of California, essentially, that the consequences of its, what I would say, hyperpunitive laws, including really draconian um, uh, provisions that put people back when they violate probation conditions, for example, they have a huge problem with that, um, that uh, they've crossed some federal line, and uh, that uh, then we step over into this institutional reform. So Scalia says, okay, if you found a violation, order that the particular individuals either be released or get their care and be done with it. And anyhow, what is really not having sufficient doctors and, and mental health facilities have to do with ordering the release of up to 46,000 people? You didn't order that they hire more doctors. You didn't, you know, what are you doing with all that? You know, aren't you really jumping up? jumping over a lot of uh, hoops. So that is an interesting feature of it. And there's a, a kind of battle going on about even if there is a violation shown, how far can courts go in remedying it, especially how far can federal courts go in telling the states what to do. And it's really interesting that you're talking about jumping ship. It's really, really, really interesting that Kennedy jump, jumped ship on this, that he's flipped over to the side of, OK, there's federal limits here, right? And that's it. Okay, we have time for one more. Yes. Um, there was an article last week in The New Yorker um, by Jeffrey Tubin saying that Justice Thomas had been, the court had been moving in his direction, at least on the civil matters, um, moving to his sort of jurisprudence. I'm wondering if, if not him, is there anyone that on the criminal matters the court is sort of moving towards generally? Well, so it's been Kennedy's court for a long time on most close issues, which is why why his flip on this is so significant. Yeah, it's definitely not Thomas. I mean, he carves out, like, for example, on the Confrontation Clause, he is all by himself, consistently concurs or dissents, depending on the outcome, and articulates his position that you only get to confront formalized materials like affidavits. So he's on his own on this one. I, I agree about Justice Kennedy. I think Justice Sotomayor is, mm -hmm. is really interesting to watch. She split the difference on the Sixth Amendment in two mm -hmm. different, you know, Bull Cumming and, and Michigan versus Bryant. And I also think um, that Justice Kagan, because she has, she has two ingredients. One, she had to, um, she, she wasn't able to participate in some of the criminal decisions because she had been at the Justice Department. So there's, it, there's a lot of variables still with her. And she has the fewest sort of pre-commitments to any positions, really, of anyone on the court. So I actually think watching her will be incredibly interesting this term. Um, and I think Sotomayor and Kennedy are probably going to be authoring a lot of the decisions in this area. I, I would also add, I mean, I just think, looking back at a, at a larger historical span, um, this is a really fascinating court on criminal law issues right now because it, it, it can't be simplified in the way that the Warren Court and Burger Courts could be. You know, the Warren Court was a whole story, obviously. The, Bur the Burger Court was very much a story about retrenchment from the Warren Court and a fight over the Warren Court, and everybody took up sides on a whole line of things. And you see this diversity of opinions and approaches now, and it's not just in, it's in both the criminal procedure and the substantive criminal law area. So in the substantive criminal law area, you often find alliances of, um, for example, Justice Scalia and Justice Ginsburg over uh, actually applying the rule of lenity, actually uh, interpreting statutes more narrowly, worrying about the scope of federal criminal law, and then uh, justices uh, justice like Alito, not so much worried about that. Breyer, not so much worried about that. And then in the procedural area, we also have these different kind of alliances depending on what I issue we're in. So uh, in, the, in the Sixth Amendment area, for example, over the last 10 years, there have been a huge push to expand rights uh, that has been led um, uh, very much uh, by Justice Scalia and Thomas. And then there are other areas of criminal procedure 
um, like the exclusionary rule, where uh, there are alliances forming to try to retrench on rights. So it's a much more complicated story, I think, than we had 20 or 30 years ago. And, um, and so it makes it very you know, interesting to watch. I, I think that's true. But to answer your question at the level of abstraction at which you asked it, think of it this way. You've got a case in the Supreme Court you really want to win. And you have reason to think that the court is likely to be 5-4. And it's civil or it's criminal, right? Whatever it is. Um, whose vote do you want to know you haven't advanced more than anyone else's? Kennedy. I think the answer is easily Justice Kennedy. Mm -hmm. And there are some exceptions, but there are exceptions. I think he is, I think he is the single most dominant justice and will be, um, uh, will, will be um, um, depending on what happens in the next presidential election. All right, well, we're out of time. Thank you all very much, and thank you to my colleagues as well. Produced by Duke University. Online at duke.edu.